My name is Hank Warner. I'm a surfboard builder, surfer in San Diego, California. Been at it for 50 years, surfing for 60 years. It's kind of been my lifestyle and my occupation. It's very re rewarding and uh, it's just great to be a part of a surfing community that has so many craftsmen in it and so many good people and characters. Wait, hold on. Put me together, take me back where I've been. We lived on a court in Mission Beach, and most people during the summer would go visit their relatives back east where they came from. We didn't have any relatives outside of San Diego because we were all San Diegans back generations and generations. So one day, this cigar smoking big old guy said, Hey, kid, you want a surfboard for a couple of weeks? And I thought, Sure, why? He goes, ah, I rented it for two weeks while we're here from Arizona and my son's afraid of it, so here. So I had a surfboard all on my own for two weeks. It was a wooden Del Velzi surfboard. So that really got me into it because I was free not to wait to borrow one, but just to go surf. So the boards were so giant and I was so small, I could stand on it like a sidewalk. So I thought, oh, I can surf right off the bat. It was definitely an instant connection because uh, as in bowling, you can bowl a 300 game and that's it. In surfing, you can never do the ultimate. You know, you're just always trying more and more and every wave's different. So it's always fresh each, each day. When I got into junior high, uh, Crystal Pier in Pacific Beach, because all my friends that surf, well, we had maybe seven or eight of us that surfed, so we'd all just congregate there until there was somebody to go out with us and we'd surf Crystal Pier pretty much every day. Um, just a, a lot of guys, we formed our first surf club and uh, we, it, was pretty, it was pretty cool. As a surfer, starting out, it really didn't matter if you were 12 or 20, because there wasn't that many people over 20, that surfed, if you surfed, you're all part of the group. So we all hung out and we all had a good influence, uh, just interactionally of people on the beach. When I was 20 years old, I took a boat from Hawaii to Australia for about a year and traveled around and actually ran into people I knew because in the surfing community, if you go to a different beach in a different country, you're instantly accepted. But when I got my, found myself in Australia, their equipment was totally different than what we were doing in California. So one day, I shaped myself a board off of what I thought would work better there that I, I could get here. And it just, it happened to be that one of the people that worked there saw it and said, hey, I, I want one like that. So technically that was my first custom order. The only thing you'd get for being a good surfer in a contest would be an old plastic trophy. So there wasn't much money in being a surfer. So shaping surfboards kind of became my way of earning a living and being able to go surf anywhere I wanted to go. There's so many diverse designs in a surfboard. And what really you're just doing is making a board to help you surf in the way you want to surf in the kind of waves you surf. If you ask somebody, a direction to get to a particular destination, it's always good to ask somebody that's been there. So because I've surfed so long in so many eras of longboards, shortboards, twin fins, you know, channel bottoms, guns, eggs, everything, that I can always sort of help the person with the design of the surfboard and where they're trying to go. My surfing is what's changed my designs more than the designs changed my surfing. The process of shaping a surfboard is first, uh, you have to know what you're going to shape. And with that in mind, you <clears throat> look through the catalogs of blanks that are available. Blanks are the big slab of foam <clears throat> and uh, pick the right one to start. Then you take a template, draw out the different points. And just like making a dress, you have a template. So you plot out different widths on the, the length of the board, draw them out with these templates. Cut it out, use a power plane to wipe down the foam pretty close to the finished board. Mm -hmm. 
and then with hand tools like shear forms, block planes, uh, blocks with sandpaper on it, you can fine sand it until it's just as clean as can be and ready to get waterproofed or the fiber bass put over it. It's not until the light bulb switches on that you're shaping negative space. You're not actually shaping the blank. You're looking at what's in the way of what you want it to look and you're just carving off the excess foam. And I always, always like the end of the process when I'm happy with how the board comes and I get to sign it, put the customer's name on there and the dimensions and you know my shape by thing. That's always satisfying when it's done. It's like you completed that and then right away you're into the next one. When you're shaping a surfboard, you really kind of get into a zen state. And uh, anybody that's walked into a shaper's room and said, hey, what's up? And you see the person jump to the roof, you're kind of bringing us back to, to earth because you get so lost. An hour can seem like 10 minutes or five minutes or a second because you're so focused on what you're doing. It's a lot like surfing. When you're in the water, you're just watching for waves, you're catching waves, and you're really not thinking of anything else but the waves. And you kind of get into that subconscious state of just reacting and not consciously doing stuff. And that kind of happens in, in shaping. Shaping a surfboard for someone's kind of like a comedian telling a joke. You throw it out there and you hope for the right response. In Southern California, you pretty much can surf all year round. So the industry, everyone kind of grew up together. And then as the years have gone by, people come and go and outsiders. Now there's big industries in Brazil, in you know the East Coast, when it used to be the East Coast could only get boards from Southern California. Uh, there's a lot of instances where the camaraderie of surfboard builders in San Diego exists today. We all help each other out. Oh, I gotta make a board kind of like this. Do you have that right template? Oh, sure, and they, we, they, we borrow it and loan it, loan it out. And we all know who we are. We all enjoy each other. And it's great seeing them at the beach or at trade shows and things like that. And now there's a majority of people surfing that have no idea where a surfboard comes from what it's all about, or the culture of surfing. Um, I really have no idea where it's gonna go. <laughs> it's, as, as some of my contemporaries have died off and disappeared, uh, there's not that many younger people coming into it because it's too hard of, of a job. You have to really have a love for making it. Well, all I can say is that uh, true surfboard building Shaping and glassing and things like that is one of the last uh, mediums of, of people's use that's still around. I mean, uh, there's a mass producing, a production of guitars. Somebody can paint a masterpiece and they can lithograph out a whole bunch of those. They're not original, but at least in a surfboard that's made handcrafted, that's still a unique object in the world of today of pop-outs. So I'm happy to be a part of that, proud of that, that's something I do.